let's open our Bibles and read the word of the Lord. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 26 today. Okay, so you can read it in your uh, whatever Bible you have, or we'll have it up at the front. Am I, am I blocking this, by the way? Can people see a little bit? Hold on. Okay, is that better? So I'm going to read the extinct 1984 version, and you guys can uh, follow along with the other. 84 or the other NIV version up front or whatever you have in front of you. Okay. So this is Jesus talking, Sermon on the Mount. We just did salt and light last time after the uh, after the Beatitudes. So we're at verse 17 starting. And we're going to go up to 26. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, let's pray. Lord, uh, we come to you, Jesus. We come just to sit at your feet and listen to your words, and Holy Spirit, we ask for your grace to just descend on us now, Lord. That, That river of life that's pouring out from your throne, just... Open our hearts now to receive from you, Lord, to to drink of your spirit as we let your words um, strike our ears and our hearts, God. Please just make an open door in us, Lord, to hear your word, to hear your voice, and to be touched by it, God, and and be moved by it, Lord, as as you lead and as you desire. Lord, I ask your mercy. I ask a covering of your mercy and anointing on the speaking of your word and the hearing of it. Uh, at this time, in Jesus' name we ask, amen. Okay, so Sermon on the Mount. Um, this is our th- fourth session on the Sermon on the Mount. And um, in, the, in the first one, I was just saying, let's just really picture ourselves that we're, we're sitting at Jesus' feet at this mountainside uh, place where Jesus was speaking. He sat down on this mountainside. His disciples, his followers came ar- and sat around him to listen to what he wanted to teach. So that's still where we're at, and uh, I hope we're still having that, that picture of sitting together. And I'm, I'm sitting there with you, right? It's not, uh, I really strongly don't feel in, in the Sermon on the Mount that I'm like giving the Sermon on the Mount as if, you know, Jesus was. I'm just, I'm sitting here and trying to listen to it and listening with you guys. And so uh, might be a little bit scattered today. This passage, I think, is really awesome. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, I think we have to understand what a gift from God this Sermon on the Mount really is to us. We have so many questions about life, about like what's right and wrong, 
How can we be truly happy? How can we be fulfilled in life? And the Sermon on the Mount is nothing less than the, the one who created life, the one who created human life, sitting down to give us a clear and fairly comprehensive statement of what a blessed and happy life consists in. It's his teaching on righteousness. It's, his t- it's all his teaching on righteousness. This word righteousness, right? But wanting to be, to, to be right, to live rightly with God and with each other. And these are the words from Jesus' own lips. They're very, very precious to us. And we're spreading this sermon out uh, over a number of weeks, but I'm hoping that people are keeping together the threads as, as it goes along, because it really was one sermon given, you know, at a, it's all meant to, to hang together, right? So I think it would be ideal if people would really find a way to be getting this into your prayer time, into your devotional time, that it wouldn't just be kind of come here on Sunday and hear what's being said, but that this would be something that you talk to God about, that you're journaling when you, when you spend time alone with him journaling, that you would come back to these words and, and, uh, and, and pray over it talk about the things we've been covering, ask him what he's saying to you personally through it. So, um, uh, you know, as we did in the, in the first lesson, Jesus said uh, that this, these words are meant to be the foundation of our life. So it's not something that we should be taking lightly, you know, that we should just be kind of let it just pass through our ear and out the other ear or wherever it goes if it doesn't go into your heart. Um, Jesus says, the way that we respond to this teaching, whether we put it into practice, it will make a huge difference in your life. It's Jesus' own word. It'll make a huge difference in your life. It will make a huge difference in other people's life. So Jesus said, you will be the salt. You are, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And we talked about this last time. How do we become salty? How do we re- retain our saltiness? How do we keep the light from being out? out? How do we keep it out? in the open instead of hiding it under a bowl. It's basically that we're, we're practicing Jesus' words. We're taking it to heart. We're hearing what he's saying. And we're letting, letting him work all the Beatitudes, work them out in our heart, in the garden of our heart. Jesus, uh, the impact that this will make will literally be eternal. Jesus chose us to bear fruit that would last. Did you know that Jesus chose you to bear fruit that will last? And he, he meant that, that we would really bear fruit. The result of our lives, the consequences of what, how we're living would last forever. It would be like in eternity, you would be looking on it and seeing the results of the fruit of your life in, all, all, in the age to come and all the way into eternity. So it's not a small deal. It's a really, I believe it's a really huge uh, deal. So I just want to encourage you guys to be taking this really, uh, really seriously, um, talking with each other about it. Okay, so let's dive into the, uh, the text for today. In this first part, there's basically two parts today. Uh, verse 17 to 20 makes up one part, and then 21 to 26. So the first part is really crucial to understand that Jesus is the authoritative teacher of Scripture. That should be obvious when we reflect on the fact that Jesus is God. Um, Jesus was there with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, when all the scripture was written, when the human authors were being inspired, when God was revealing it, Jesus was there. He knew what God meant. He knew what God intended to say. What were the motivations of God in in expressing these words? So Jesus understands the heart of God in a way that no one else does or can. And in Jesus' day, just like in our own time, many people are uh, interpreting and teaching and applying scripture as the guide to life. But in many ways, they were doing it wrong. People in Jesus' time were doing it wrong. They were teaching stuff that was partly true, but also contained many misconceptions. Sometimes their way of interpreting God's commandments was too narrow. So it was like limiting the meaning of God's commands when when God had not intended it to be limited in that way. For example, his teachings on on murder that we're going to do today and and adultery next week or two weeks from now. Um, Other times, they were too broad. They were broadening things out that God intended to be very narrow and specific. So, for example, Jesus' teaching on divorce. 
um, they were saying, well, Moses commanded us to give a certificate of divorce. Um, you know, if anyone has an issue with their spouse, they just get a certificate and, and go, right? Um, they, were, they, were, they were broadening out something. To, so Jesus clarifies in each of the teachings that Jesus gives in the next section, all the way up to verse 48, there's a pattern that emerges. Um, they all involve a contrast between some way that people were interpreting and understanding scripture and then Jesus' own authoritative take on what that scripture actually means. Right, so you look at it, right? Every, it, every section starts. Um, verse 21, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. He's referring to the Ten Commandments, but also you have heard, you have heard. The people had heard that it was said to the people long ago, they'd heard it from the people who are teaching the law to them. Um, and then that teaching was coming with a certain interpretation. Um, in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. In verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife. Uh, in verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said, right? And again in verse 38, in verse 43. So each of these um, little sections, teachings, follows the same structure. Um, Okay, um, so we have, to, we have to see what Jesus is doing. Jesus makes clear that he wants to contrast his own interpretation, his authoritative take on these passages with uh, false or incomplete or um, you know, mixed up interpretations. He makes this clear in a couple places that this is what he's doing. First, um, Jesus says that he's come to fulfill the law in verse 17. He's come to fulfill the law. And we're going to think about the meaning of the word fulfill um, there because that's very interesting. I mean, uh, Jesus obviously didn't mean that he had come to replace the law with something else that was distinct from it. Uh, but fulfill has to do with, I mean, you can, you can hear that word as meaning completing or um, filling up something that's somehow lacking, but you can also hear it, and I think the meaning that Matthew had when he said fulfill, when he had has Jesus say, um, I've come to fulfill the law, what it means is to bring it to realization. Okay? So, um, to cause God's will to be obeyed as it should be, as it was meant to be obeyed, and to cause God's promises to receive their fulfill fulfillment. So the law, the teaching on the law, that it would actually happen in people's lives, that God's righteousness would be happening in people's lives, and that the promises of God would be fulfilled, the prophets. The prophets we could categorize with promise. I mean, it's not really exclusive. There is a lot of promise in the, in the law too. But if you think about the law and the prophets as uh, summarizing the whole Old Testament, word of God, um, Jesus came to fulfill it. In other words, Jesus came to see that it would actually be fulfilled. And of course, Jesus fulfilled the law of God and the prophets in his own person, first and foremost. He himself fulfilled God's law to the uttermost, like without a, a kind of scrap of falling short. Jesus perfectly fulfilled the will of God, the law of God. And then he also called into uh, himself into his sphere of influence, a community of people who would also be living in the righteousness of God. And um, first and foremost, how does that happen? It's that we, like his righteousness is imparted to us. Even while we're sinners, he, he reconciles us with himself and he becomes our righteousness. And so the scripture says that we should put on Christ. We should clothe ourselves with Christ, not relying on ourselves, not relying on our own effort, but on what he has done for us. He becomes a substitutionary, I mean, his righteousness substitutes for ours. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there that we just say, okay, Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus' righteousness substitutes for me. And so I'm just going to go on sinning, living spiritually lazy, disobedient to God. I don't really care about my life or what I'm doing. But I'm still righteous because I have, I mean, you would still be righteous. But Jesus intends that righteousness that he imparts to us, that he gives to us, to have an effect in our life to actually transition our life from the state of dullness, of, of, of brokenness, of bondage, um, into a life of freedom, of fullness of God's freedom that he is calling us into. So it would actually make a difference and impact in our lives. And that's why in the, in the Beatitudes, 
which we're saying is kind of like the central part of this this uh, sermon, the what it all kind of turns on, all starts with the word blessed. Jesus keeps saying blessed, blessed, blessed. He wants you to be blessed. And he's teaching us the way to be blessed. And that has to do with righteousness, being right with God in every area of our lives. I mean, now we can say like, hey, how can that even be possible? Uh, obviously, in our own experience, it doesn't happen, right? We often fall short in so many different ways, so many dimensions of our lives. Uh, we just talk about, you know, our f- how we use our finances. We could talk about how we relate to food. We could relate to other people. I mean, Jesus is going to talk about, we're talking about anger today as our f- focal point. But lots of ways we fall short. Okay, obviously we fall short. Nevertheless, Jesus is calling us into his righteousness. And he, he wants us to be righteous. He says as much. The second place where he says this is uh, in verse 20. Can we look at verse 20? Can we read this together? Okay, verse 20. Mm, starts at four there, right? Four I tell you. Okay, so like five lines from the bottom. Okay, can we go and read this all together? Let's do it. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this would be a shocking statement for the people who heard Jesus. This would be like a shocking statement, right? Be like, what? Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Do you know who the Pharisees are, Jesus? Like, these guys were hardcore. These guys were, like, fully dedicated, right? I mean, they, t- they took the word of God. They, like, memorized basically the whole law of Moses. Like, they knew every single commandment. They followed it to the detail. I mean, they thought they were anyway, right? I mean, following it out to the letter. So, for example, even, the, even in their tithing, like, if they had a little herb garden, you know, like on the side of their house with some mint or something or dill growing there, they would shave off like 10% of every plant, right? And they'd like weigh it out and they would give that as their tithe, right? Like they were diligent. These guys were hardcore. These were like the people that you're like, who's righteous? Well, it's those guys. And Jesus goes, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisee and the teacher of the law, you won't even get in to the kingdom of heaven. You won't even enter it. Jesus, you know, this is supposed to be shocking, right? Um, And so what might Jesus mean by this? Or what does he mean? Well, one thing is clear. He means for us to be righteous. He wants us to be righteous. And this is not like a burdensome thing. This is not a burdensome thing that's distinct from the gospel of God's grace. To be righteous is to be right with God. It's to live in a right relationship with God. It's not burdensome, right? It's like that is freedom. That is the freedom that the Lord is calling us into. So he's not, he's not putting this heavy weight on us and going, oh, I just, I know that you uh, hate this stuff, but I just want, you're just going to have to do all the stuff that you hate and it's going to suck and just heavy weight on you. Boom. That's not what he's doing. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's saying, I want you to be free. I want you to experience the freedom of God in your life, in every area of your life. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have a vibrant heart love relationship with God, just flooding everything that you do and everything that you are. I want you to experience the fullness of God in your life. Okay, but Jesus is the in- interpretive. One, one other thing uh, that we're, and one other place we see Jesus' authority is if you go right to the end and you look at verse chapter 7, verse 28 uh, and 29. And there, it, Matthew records the response that people had to Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Okay, so the contrast there is explicit. And we need to distinguish three things here. And this, this passage doesn't really make sense, what Jesus is doing, unless you distinguish these three things. First thing is the law of Moses or the law and the prophets, okay, the Old Testament. So on the one hand, you have the law of Moses, which was written down, you know, and, and, and it was preserved. Okay, the actual, what the law of Moses actually says, what the Old Testament Bible actually says. Secondly, there's the interpretation that the people had heard from the religious leaders of the day. That was the second thing. Okay, there's two distinct things, right? There's the law, 
itself, kind of what's written. Then there's the interpretation of it by the religious leaders. And thirdly, there's what Jesus says about the law in this passage. And each of the things he says has a section on he's exercising some kind of corrective influence, okay, which we could see as uh, also relating to fulfilling the law or seeing to it that the law is going to be fulfilled, that God's word is going to be fulfilled. Okay, so Jesus is addressing the flawed interpretation uh, interpretation of the Pharisees. Why was it flawed? Well, again, going back to verse 20, it's flawed because it was not sufficient. The way the Pharisees were approaching the law in the way that they practiced it, in the way that they taught it, was not sufficient for the kind of righteousness Jesus is talking about. It wasn't sufficient to enter the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you won't enter the kingdom. That means they're not entering the kingdom, right? Their, their righteousness is not enough the way that they're going. Um, Jesus, what Jesus is emphatically not saying is that there's a problem with the law of Moses. He's not saying there's a problem with the law of Moses, right? Emphatically, he, he explicitly links righteousness to practicing and teaching the word of God. What does he say? Let's look at some of these statements. Um, we call this, uh, okay, people use the expression having a high view of scripture. You know what that means? Having a high view of scripture? It's kind of a fancy way of saying, yeah? Yeah, you, I mean, you you hold it in a kind, it, it's, it's kind of a fancy way of saying, like, you, you really um, think scripture is important or something. Or like, you, you could have a low view of scripture. Right? If you have a low view of scripture, you're kind of like, well, yeah, there's scripture. Um, it's good, but it's not that awesome. It's not that kind of important to us. It's not kind of something you have to pay really careful attention to and that's kind of like binding on you in your life. If you have a high view of scripture, you put it really up there. And one of our statements as a church, right, we, we're like, Jesus rules us. One of our core values as a church is that Jesus rules us through his word and his spirit. So in our church, we seek to practice and have and uphold a high view of scripture. We take it really seriously. The Bible's like, it is our, it is, okay, the Holy Spirit is needs to work through it. And it's going to be imbalanced if you just have scripture without the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Right? And that's part of our thing too. But scripture is very important. It's like our authority. Jesus rules the church through his word, through the scripture. Um, and Jesus had that view of scripture. He had a very high view of scripture. And so what he says, and of course, Jesus, at Jesus' time, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He's talking about the Old Testament scripture. And what he says is, now some people were observing the way that Jesus lived and taught, and they had questions about him. And they wondered whether Jesus wasn't, in some ways, undermining the law or abolishing the law. Can you think of any examples where Jesus, uh, you know, has conflicts, where people might have questions about his understanding of the law or his obedience to the law, to Torah. Anybody have que uh, examples? Can you think of? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much every Sabbath day, Jesus uh, is healing on the Sabbath or he lets his disciples pick some grains and rub them and eat them. And, and the Pharisees jump out, right? They're like hiding in the grain. They jump out and they're like, hey! You're doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath, right? You're breaking the Sabbath law. Your disciples are eating without washing their hands, right? They're unclean. Why don't they follow the traditions of the elders? And um, so Jesus, and but the Sabbath, right? I mean, Jesus, and then Jesus in response, he says, well, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So you guys should be like learning from Jesus instead of criticizing Jesus for how he's doing. But still, Jesus did things that were contrary to how people understood or had interpreted, or what they had heard about the law, about the scripture. Do you know Jesus said at one point in scripture, um, he said that all foods are clean? Which is very interesting. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail here, but it's very interesting, right? You're like, because Jesus says here, not even the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, not a single dot on an I will by any means disappear from the law, until everything is carried to fulfillment, to completion, everything's accomplished. Even as long as he the heavens and the earth remain, not even the smallest mark in the law will disappear. Right? 
That's intense. It's intense. But Jesus, who said that, also said, all foods are clean. And you go back to scripture, and you're reading Leviticus, right? And it says, this is not clean, this is not clean. Eating, uh, if you eat an animal that has a certain kind of hoof and chews the cud, then it's like unclean, right? If you eat like salamanders, it's unclean. If you eat certain kind of like uh, vultures and stuff, it's unclean. If you eat an owl, it's unclean. Right? Um, so what's going on, right? So, I mean, I know this is an interesting issue, and I don't want to go too deep into it here, but it is interesting that Jesus, who had such a high view of Scripture, also says things elsewhere where we're kind of like, oh, interesting. Jesus believes that every, even the least commandment, the least commandment, the, the Jewish teachers would say, um, they would actually rank the commandments. There's like 613 commandments in the law. And they would rank them as to like high, greater and least, right? And the least commandment was the one, it's somewhere in Deuteronomy. I didn't write down the reference, but it's about a bird's nest. If you encounter a bird's nest and you want to get the eggs, okay, don't take the mother bird with the eggs, but let the mother bird go. And they regarded that as like the least of the commandments. Nevertheless, it was a commandment of God, right? And Jesus is saying, like, not even the least letter is going to cease to be binding, okay? Yet, we have to see it, when Jesus talks about this, we have to see Scripture, the Old Testament, as fulfilled in Jesus. And it's binding on us, but as it's fulfilled in the person of Jesus, who is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the revelation of God. And so, you know, so there's a kind of a tension there. It's an interesting part, and I, I don't want to dwell too much longer on this, but it is very interesting. At very least, we can see Jesus has, he has a very high view of Scripture, and he has a very high view of people who really value the Scripture. He says there's two kinds of people. People who break even the least of these commandments and teach other people to do it. People who say, hey, that part of the Old Testament, that doesn't, that's not really important. Now, again, we have to interpret it. We have to see it as fulfilled in Jesus. But every, if you do that, right, if you say, if you practice in your own practice, say this part of Scripture, this part of God's Word is not important, it's not relevant, okay, and you, 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 pr you think of it that way in your own life, and then you teach that to other people too, Jesus said you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, interesting, again, you might, you'll still be in the kingdom of heaven. You might still be in the kingdom of heaven. But if your attitude towards God's word is like that, where you're like kind of lax about it, you're kind of like, oh, some parts of it, you just put behind your back, we don't really need that. Um, you might be in the kingdom by God's grace still, but you'll be least. And he says, the people who practice and teach these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus' attitude toward the word of God. Okay, but again, there's the word of God, and then there's what, how people interpreted the word of God in Jesus' time, the religious leaders, and then there's what Jesus says about it, and how Jesus himself fulfilled it, right? These are three different things we keep in mind. So as we transition to this next section, um, we have to see what, what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I was reading some stuff, and um, someone says there's like six... Basically, what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount you can think of, if you think of the Beatitudes as flowers that are growing in the garden of your heart, okay, then, then Jesus identifies six things that we could call weeds, that we could see as weeds. So when you're trying to grow a garden, one big hindrance to growing flowers in a garden is the weeds. Okay? And I don't know. Actually, I tried to look through and make sense following uh, this teaching on that there were six. I'm not convinced that there are, that it's helpful to pinpoint them as six, but definitely what Jesus is doing is he's looking at various negative things that hinder us in walking out the blessed life of the Beatitudes. There's, there's multiple negative things that he addresses, and we're looking at one today. It's called anger. Okay, so that's going to be one of the, the weed that we look at. We can also think of these things, I would add another metaphor, as chains. The things that Jesus is saying, Look, you want to live in God's freedom, but there are these chains. There are chains over you. They're binding you. They're holding you back. And Jesus wants to break them off so that you can be free. He wants to deliver us from, from these uh, chains. 
So we also want to have clarity about these things so that we can be free, so that we can break off any bondage, any of the demonic bondage influence that's over our lives that leads us into this kind of dullness of heart and uh, brokenness and hinders us from having a vibrant life with God and, and sense of God's presence. And, um, we want to we want to have clarity for our own lives, but we also want to have clarity because when we encounter other people, and we want to counsel other people, or God puts us in a position to give advice. Someone comes up and talks to us; they have this problem. We want to have clarity in our minds about the things that are the hindrances to the to the kingdom of God uh, growing in people's lives. Okay, so for those reasons, we got to pay attention to these. Um, we uh, we really I, we don't want to be least in the kingdom. Um, God made us to be great, not to be least. God didn't make us to just be like bare minimum, just barely getting by, by the skin of our teeth. You know how Lot got out of Sodom and Gomorrah? You, you remember that story? How Lot got out? The, uh, you know, the angels come, they're like, okay, here we are. We're God's messengers. God is going to destroy the city. Get out of the city. Lot just kind of hangs out. Uh, uh, da, da, da. He talks to his sons in law. He's like, "Hey, I think uh, I think God might be uh, going to destroy the city." And then his sons just laugh. They're like, ha, "Good one, good one, man." And he's like, "No, no, no." I'm, uh, yeah, they just laugh at him. Right? He has no like spiritual power, no force in his life. And then finally, like Abraham is praying for him. He's like interceding for Lot. And finally, the angels warn him multiple times. Finally, they actually literally grab him by the hand and yank him out of the city. They pull him physically out of the city uh, just before, like, the fire and burning sulfur rains down on it, right? So, like, he, okay, he got out, right? He escaped God's wrath. God doesn't want us to be least in that way, that we just barely skim by, you know, by the grace of God, but we let the grace of God work powerfully in us and, and, and lead us into the righteousness of God. Not that it's not talking about earning our salvation. So I'm going to just be very clear again about that. I know I've said this many times. It's not what we're talking about. You can be in the kingdom of God and and you know fall short in so many ways. But we don't want to be happy with that, with that state of living in uh, separation from God. That we don't have a, a sense of God's vibrant power and presence in our life. We don't live that way. We want to be blessed. Okay. So let's go to the next part: anger and murder. And let's, let's look at these, okay? So, all right, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. Anyone know where that's from? Ten Commandments, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Which one? I think it's the sixth one. Is it six? Is it sixth or fifth? Anyway, Ten Commandments, right? That's like the, the core statement. That's like the summary of the law, Okay. Um, so you've heard that it was said, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And what they're talking about there is in the law of Moses, there were all kinds of requirements that if someone violated one of the commandments, if they broke a commandment, they would be brought on trial before the judges of the people. Moses appointed judges to judge these cases, and if you committed murder, you would be brought in front of the trial, and you would be judged by the judges. And if you were found to be guilty, you would be put to death according to the law of Moses, right? So anyone who murders will be subjected to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is, I don't know how you pronounce that, but he'll be answerable to the Sanhedrin, to the courts. And, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Okay, and it's based on that verse that I came up with the title of the message today, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, what you looking at, fool? And I thought that was Mr. T, but Mr. T actually says, do you guys remember Mr. T? Anyone remember Mr. T? Okay. He, his expression is, I pity the fool, right? I pity the fool. He doesn't keep the commandments of God. But if you're saying to someone, right, you might say to someone, what you looking at, fool? Call them a fool, right? Jesus said, "You anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. Now, interesting. I don't think what Jesus means here 
we read this, you know, and it's like, okay, so any time that I, these weren't like, s- really, I mean, these were just expressions of contempt. You get mad at someone, someone bothers you, you're like, you idiot. I don't think Jesus is saying, any time, if you've even done that one time, you're going to hell. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. <laughs> because, okay, here's, okay, if you don't believe me, here's why. Jesus called people fools. <laughs> he did, right? He called people fools. He said, you blind fools. Um, he, he actually did that, right? And Jesus also, we notice, got angry sometimes. He got angry, Okay. So this is not a simplistic, like, if you were ever angry one time in your life, you're going to hell. You might as well just give up, right? You were angry that one time. You said, you fool. Okay, you're in hell. But, okay, Jesus doesn't mean that, but he does mean something very, very important, and he means us to take this very seriously. And otherwise, he wouldn't raise this issue of being in danger of the fire of hell. The fire of hell is not cool. It's not something you want to be connected with, right? It's not the kind of place you want to go plan a vacation to go there it's not good um and jesus is really so he's kind of ramping up the seriousness of what he's saying by bringing this in okay so what does he mean well okay let's let's think of a couple things here now one thing to note is the king james version adds in verse 22 um, but i tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister or brother sorry new niv has brother or sister um without just cause But that phrase, without just cause. Anyone who's angry, without cause. Um, So there's different manuscript evidence, and people's opinions on this is about split, whether you should include that clause or not. The NIV includes it in a footnote. Okay? If you look at that, right? So the NIV kind of keeps it in, but it puts it in a footnote. The King James Version just has it right in the main text. Okay? Angry with a brother, without cause. Um, Will be subject to judgment. So what is Jesus saying here? Or how should we take this? Okay. The thing that we have to see is that anger... Let's actually put the diagram up. Can we put the diagram up now? I'm going to show you this diagram, okay? I was praying about this, and I came up with this idea. So here's the idea. That that brown line is is, uh, earth, okay? It's like ground, dirt, okay? And underneath the soil is your inner life, your inward, what goes on inside your heart, your emotions, your emotional life, your motivational structure, your values, all that kind of stuff, your heart attitudes, okay, that's your inner life. That's under the soil. In the sense that it's not, people don't see that directly. It's kind of like, you know, it's not seen. What is, and then I put decisions on the line because I was kind of like, are decisions part of your outward life or inward life? It kind of has an element of both. But then what we can say as our outward life is our words, what we say to people, and how we act, our actual actions and deeds, what we do, and then the impact or the consequence of what we do. That all makes part of our outward life. Okay? So if that part of this metaphor makes sense, okay, below the ground, above the ground, then here's what happens. Circumstances of life come along, right? It's kind of like a a dandelion seed, right? Floating through the air. And it comes into your heart, soil. Now, this could be any kind of thing that... Here we're talking about anger. So we're talking about the seed of anger. And you're going along in life, and suddenly something happens, and someone does something that really bothers you. Right? It gets you annoyed. You get angry. Okay? Could be... For me, I'm walking down the street, and the way that people drive, right? I'm like... You have a red light. I am crossing the street right now. And and they're just turn in front of me, right? It makes me angry. I'm like, that's not cool. Uh, We do stuff to each other. Someone says something to you, just they say it in the wrong way. It just gets under your skin, right? And there's a little seed of anger that's like, do, 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 and it lands in the dirt, right? And if you don't deal with that at that point when it's just a little seed, what happens to the dandelion seed? What happens? <laughs> yeah. It grows a root, right? <laughs> it gets a root. And the root, see, I knew you guys were like, because I knew you guys are like visual learners, so I try to incorporate this into the, um, but it grows a root, you know, and I'm very familiar with 
because they put that um, you're not allowed to use pesticides anymore, right? And at least in the city, and so, well, there are some like green pesticides that you can use, but I don't know. I need to investigate that. But I haven't been doing that the last few years. So basically, there's just like I'm walking around, and there's so many dandelions everywhere, and the seeds are just they're actually coming up again now, right? Because it's not cold enough because of the warm weather we've been having. They're coming up again. Dandelions are like persistent. They are seriously persistent. They are out to take over the world. And, you know, they come and they're floating in the air and they land on your grass and they go, go in the soil and they start growing and they choke everything out, right? And they grow fast. They grow deep roots. You ever try to pull up a dandelion? Every spring I spend hours and hours. Uh, to pull up the root is really hard because dandelions, they know you're going to try to pull them up. They know that you're not going to like them, right? So you pull it and it just snaps off and the root stays in the ground. A couple weeks later, there's another dandelion. Right? You have to pull up at least three quarters of the root to get the dandelion out of the soil. And it's hard to do that. And so they have these little machines and stuff that you use that grab on the root, right? And then you yank it out, and your hands are like bleeding after using this machine, you know, for like two or three hours on a Saturday. And, but, you know, so the point is if you don't deal with the seed of anger when it's still a seed, at that point, all you'd have to do is walk up to the seed and go like, boop. Right? And I don't know, throw it somewhere where it's not going to grow. Throw it in your toilet or something. Right, But if you don't deal with it, it grows a root. It gets established. right? And it's establishing itself in your emotional life. And it's spreading out, you know, and it's getting deep. It's, it's establishing itself there in your emotional life, in how you're motivated, in the attitudes of your heart. It's, you know, it's getting rooted in you. It's got an underground root system. And then, if you still don't deal with it and pull it up, what happens? It goes to the next stage, right? Okay? Flowers of trouble, fruit of defilement. Okay? It bears fruit in your life. And then, it starts making lots more seeds. And the seeds break off, and they go into the air, and the whole process repeats, right? Oh, I hate dandelions. I hate dandelions, seriously. My kids all know that I hate dandelions, you know? But Hebrews, let's look at this verse, okay? Because this is talking about anger. Uh, Hebrews twelve fifteen, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Let me read that again, okay, that verse. Just pay attention to this. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The bitter root that anger develops into, when you get bitter against someone, right, you have that initial thing about, about anger. Something does something that bothers you. It annoys you. You don't deal with it, right? You don't go up to them. You don't take care of it. You don't um, openly talk about it, deal with the issue. It grows a root of bitterness. And by the time your bitterness, when you're thinking about that person that you got angry at, you just hold so much against them, you know? And it's like anger multiplied. It's like um, the progress of a disease, Okay, where you have like an initial cancer cell and it's multiplying now into like a tumor. It's getting very serious. It's having a big impact on your, on your physiological existence. The cancer, right? Same way with bitterness. And then it springs up and it causes trouble because you didn't deal with the root of bitterness, but it was coloring all of your emotions, your motivations. It's having an impact. It's hindering you from coming to God and living in freedom of God and fullness and a vibrant spirit with God. It's hindering all of that. And then eventually it springs up and it causes trouble because now out of all that distorted and messed up emotional life that you have under the surface, that's now where your words come from and where your actions flow out of, that place. And so you cause trouble to people, right? You say things that really hurt other people. You do things against other people. And it just escalates, okay? So 
Let's look at one example of this. Okay, one example. The example of Cain in the Bible. Remember what happened with Cain? Cain and Abel bring offerings to God. This is Genesis chapter 4. Um, and God accepts Abel's offering, Cain's brother, but not Cain's offering. He doesn't accept Cain's offering. He, he doesn't look on it with favor. Cain gets really mad. And it says, so Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now, I might be exaggerating, but I, this word downcast, his face was downcast. I think it's very significant. Um, he's angry at his brother for doing the right thing that he wasn't able to do, for getting God's favor. And then he's angry at God for not accepting his offering. He's like, God, come on, I brought you an offering. What's wrong with you? You should accept it, right? You should be like accepting it and blessing me. He's angry at his brother. He's angry at God. So he's looking down. He's looking down, right? He's not looking at his brother. He's not looking up into the eyes of his brother to say like, Abel, I, I'm having this trouble or somehow work out what's going on. He's not looking up to God, who is the one who could really help him and give him counsel. His face is downcast. He's looking down. And he perceives this injustice, and it makes him angry. Okay. Now, notice what God does. The Lord, in his tender counsel, comes up to Cain, and he asks him questions. He goes, why are you angry, Cain? Why is your face downcast? Good question. The thing is, Cain didn't have a basis to be angry. And if he was to think it through, get kind of cool-headed, take a step back, pray about it, he would actually, God would help him to realize that he, sh he doesn't have a reason to be angry. So God is asking these questions, right? And then, he, and then he gives him this counsel. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? The problem, Cain, is not with Abel. Abel is not out to get you by his righteous life. He's not doing anything against you. I'm not out to get you. Um, Cain, by not accepting your offering. I love you. I care about you. The, the issue is you're not doing what's right. So what you have to do is think about how you're not doing right and then, and, then, and then get it right. Make it right. That's it. Easy steps. Figure out, okay, I'm not doing right. Okay, repent. Okay, I repent, God, that I didn't do it right. Let's figure out how to do it the right way. Okay, and then problem solved. God said, look, we could just take that seed that's on your heart right now, Cain, and just bloop, pick it up and throw it away, right? It's not going to get a root. It's not going to bear fruit of trouble. Cain doesn't listen, right? Um, Cain doesn't listen. God says to him, if you do not do what is right, he gives him a warning. If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. In other words, check it while it's still at the seed level. It wants, it's like a dandelion. It wants to take over your life. It wants to take over your lawn. It wants to choke out all the grass, make your lawn look terrible, spread seeds everywhere. It's just awful, right? That's what it wants. It's, but right now, it's just a seed. So you can deal with it right now. It's not going to be that hard to deal with right now, if you deal with it now. Um, Cain doesn't listen. He's so consumed by his own thinking. He's not listening to anyone else, his own inward problem. The seed moves very quickly to the root of bitter hatred in his heart. And the fruit, he makes a decision. He says, Abel, let's go out into the field. And then what does he do? He kills his brother in the field. He kills his brother. He commits murder. And this is what Jesus is telling us, that murder, and the way that the Pharisees are teaching murder, they're like, do not kill. As if that was the whole thing that God meant. As long as you don't actually go out and kill somebody, you're okay. And this is how we talk, right? How many Have you not heard this? People say this? Hey, I'm a pretty good person. I never killed anybody. Like, that's what you think is a good person? Just that you, actually, you never killed anybody? Great! It's great that you didn't kill anybody. Okay? <laughs> But I think there's like more dimensions of what it means to be good. And Jesus is saying there's a whole process that's going on here between the seed of anger and the fruit of coming to the point where you actually kill people. And by the way, right, we live in a world where people kill each other. People literally kill each other, right? I mean, you know, it happens all the time. You can read about it in the news any day you want. People actually kill each other. They take each other's lives, right? 
So this is not just a theoretical story about stuff that, that might possibly happen. It, it's stuff that happens all the time in our world. And actually, if you look at the, the, the narrative of Genesis, what happens after Cain is that this passes on to his descendants. And you get this guy a few generations down named Lamech. You guys know about Lamech? Lamech was married to two women. And he calls them in one day, and he like seems to have written this song. It's, like, it's crazy, right? It's like, here's the song. Now, there's a lot of music today that pretty much is just like Lamech's song. Interesting, okay? Here's Lamech's song in Genesis 4, 23. Lamech said to his wives, I, I, don't, I always imagine him having this like deep voice or something. Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times. This is like his, right? It puts it in this other format in the Bible because it's meant to be, it's like a poem. It's like a song that the guy wrote about how he killed this guy who bothered him. This guy insulted him. He's like, screw you. Boom, kills him. And then he writes a song about it and he like sings it to his wives. Have you heard songs like this? There are songs that are like this. They're like, I took my gun and boom, killed this guy who was annoying, right? I mean, okay, I don't sound as cool as how they're, you know, how they sing it, but, right? Like, there literally are songs that are like this. You're just listening to the music in your car. You're like, yeah, I killed this guy (laughs) for wounding me, right? It's like, no, (laughs) no, that's not good. That's not a good song. Um, So it passed on to Lamech, and then look what happened a few generations down the road. What happened? The flood. The flood happened. God looked at the world. What did God say to Noah, right? Look at verse, chapter 6, verse uh, 12 and 13. God, okay, no, verse from verse 11. Now the earth, why did God bring the flood on the earth? Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. It was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. So dandelions, right, they don't stop stop with a single dandelion. It grows up, the seed of anger. It becomes a bitter root. It bears the fruit. It starts scattering seeds. Here's your children sitting at your table, listening to you, talk to each other, right? And you're talking to each other in this angry way. And that the little seeds float out and go into their hearts, right? And they, that's, how they, that's how it passes on, right? And it could be not even how you're talking to each other. You're talking about someone else. Oh, today at, the, at work, this guy, can you believe it? This guy came up to me and he said this. Oh, if only I had a gun, I would just kill the guy, right? And I'd make a poem about it. You know, we say this about people. How do you talk about people? How do you talk to people? How do you talk about people? We do this. It's a pervasive thing. This issue of anger is a profound human issue. Kids are angry. Even from, like, very young age, they get angry. We did not have to teach our children how to be angry. They somehow just knew how to do it. Right? Even cute little Hudson, believe it or not, running around. Cute little Stephanie. How old is Stephanie? She gets really mad. <laughs> she knows how to do it. It's just passed on to our kids through our like fallen genes, getting angry. It's a profound issue. And Jesus is saying, we are going to, the people of God, the people in the kingdom of God are going to be different than the world, Okay. We are not just going to tolerate seeds of anger in our hearts and just be okay with that, right? And go, you fool! You idiot! That way. Or like this kind of like sarcastic, demeaning, put-down language that we use to each other. Jesus says, it's not okay. It's not okay because it's part of a process that leads to murder, that leads to death. 
It's a continuum. So if you're like the Pharisees and you're just like, oh, don't murder, okay, you didn't kill anybody, you're good. We didn't kill anybody, or like at least, I don't know, the thing about being subject to the court, to the judgment, we didn't get caught, at least. You're like, this is, Jesus is like, we are going to deal with this at the root. We're going to deal with this at the seed level. That's how the people of, of the kingdom of God live. So it's not like you're angry one time, and therefore God says, oh, you're going to hell, throws you in hell, because you, were, you said you fool one time. It's about how you deal with the anger when it comes up. Are you okay with it growing there? Are you just like letting it grow? Letting it grow up inside of you? Letting the root develop? Letting it color how your patterns of behavior and your patterns of motivation? Are you okay with that? If you are, you are in danger of being brought to the court because it's going to issue in a process that where you would do something criminal and actually be brought to the court and be judged. Not only that, but it's part of a process that you are in danger of the fires of hell, Jesus says. Again, it's not like I say you fool one time, I get mad. Jesus is like, you're going to hell. It's that you're in danger of the fire of hell because if you're talking to people in that way, in that angry way, and you're okay with it, you don't care, you don't mind, you're not doing anything about it. You're not repenting. You're not bringing that to God. If you're okay with it, then you are on a track which, where you could, in the end, end up denying Jesus' grace, denying Jesus because, because you're opposing his leadership. You're opposing Jesus' leadership who taught this. I think that's the significance, and that's what makes this really serious. And that's why Jesus is saying to you, right, to us, as his people, your righteousness is going to surpass that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. In that it's not just about this outward thing or about getting in trouble because of something that you do outwardly against somebody. You're going you're gonna to deal with it. Now, how do we deal with it would be another question. And um, I think, first of all, uh, you, you notice it happening in you. You're getting angry. Something happened that bothered you. Now, it might be there might be a good reason to be angry. And sometimes what you might have to do, but I would say, first of all, you bring it to God. You bring it to God and talk to God about it. That's where Cain went wrong, right? God was trying to talk to him. God was like, I want to tell you about this. I want to help you work through this. I, I see that there's a problem. I'm not denying that there's a problem. I would like to help you to walk through it and resolve it and deal with it at this stage. God wants to do that. He's committed to do it. If you will pray, if you will bring it to him, uh, maybe you need to seek counsel from mentors or leaders in your church. Talk about it. Bring it out, right? Um, don't, just, don't just go to your friend and start complaining about that person who did this, right? And start criticizing the person to somebody else. No, you're, you're, you, take, you make the move of repentance before God. It starts before God just coming and talking about it. Okay, and then if there's something there that was a real issue um, with that person, sometimes you may have to approach the person and tell them that what they did made you angry and that there's something wrong there and you need to talk about it and you guys need to work through it. You need to resolve it. Like Jesus, I don't think Jesus is just superficial and this goes to other things like if your brother sins against you, he says go to him and tell him what happened and if he repents, then good, forgive him. That's the process of reconciliation that happens. So I think God intends us to, um, yeah, to be open with it, to deal with it right away. Passage comes up. So if we could look at where this goes next. The next section here starts with the word therefore. Because I think sometimes people don't really know how to interpret these next verses too. Um, so let's read them. Um, okay, let's all go together. Can we read it? Therefore, if you there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Now, if you read these verses out of context, uh, just pull out these verses and say, hey, your brother has something against you. So your brother's bothered by you for some reason. Anyone here um, know of anyone who's kind of bothered with them? 
Yeah. Two people are honest, right? No, anybody, anybody in the world, like, right? Someone who is, is bothered by you, has something against you in some way, right? Sh- is Jesus saying just, okay, get out of church, right? Go and if someone ha- is bothered with you for some reason, for any old reason, get out of the church and go have a meeting with them, sit down, you know, have a long discussion, work through it. I don't think that's what he's talking about because that would basically be, mostly it would be pretty much impossible to know, to be able to know, right, who are all the people who are against me. And then in all the situations, I mean, some people, it's just they're not going to be open to talk. So I think it's related to what he says just before. And that's why there's the word therefore. It, it intends to show you that this section is connected to what he had just said before. And what he had just said before was, um, if you're saying to your brother, raka, this term of contempt, or you say to your brother, you fool. So you have let the anger grow into a bitter root and it's bearing fruit in your words. And you're saying things to your brother that hurt them. And that's the brother in the next verse who has something against you. Because of your expression of anger and hurt, now this brother, you've damaged this brother. Or sister. I'm using brother in a, in a generic uh, sense. right? Um, that's the context where Jesus says, if you've done this, if your anger has got to a level where you've let it bear fruit in your words and or actions and it's hurt somebody else, you need to deal with that with utmost urgency. Even to the point of, if you're at a worship service, if you're at some kind of a, you should just, you should go and take care of that first. That's how important Jesus sees it as being. It's a very, very high priority. Why? Well, the next part um, uh, tells us, right? I mean, gives some more color to this. Um, Can we go to the next section? Yeah. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, now Jesus is using an analogy here to a case where someone owes a debt. You borrowed money, you said you'd pay it back, you didn't pay it back on the date that you said it, the guy's upset, he's, he's in a sense, your adversary, he's, he knows that you owe him the money, he knows his case is legit, He knows if he takes it to court, he'll get the money from you. Jesus says, take care of this quickly now. While you're still on the way. with, While you're still with your brother. Because what might happen is, your brother who has been offended by you, now he's still with you. He's still close enough by. There's a relationship there. You You can deal with it. You can work it out. Okay? But it might, if you don't deal with it now, quickly it's going to escalate. And it will get to a point where now your brother is no longer there and like open to talk. It's gone up to another level. Okay? So in the analogy, the guy who's got a claim against you, he actually goes to the, to the uh, judge, the person who's in charge of arbitrating cases. And so now it's gone up to another level. It's becoming kind of public. Other people are getting involved in this. And the judge might hand you over to the officer, which would be like a collection agency or something like that, right? And then, and then pressure is coming on you. And this is getting intense now, right? You're, feel, you're really feeling the pressure. And if you still don't deal with it, you might be in prison. And Jesus says, even though you're in prison, you still have to pay it back. But now it's going to be a lot harder to pay it back because you're in prison. You can't work anymore. You can't do... Th- so he's saying, look, this stuff... If we don't deal with anger when it's at the seed stage or just starting to put down its root, if we don't learn how to deal with the spirit of anger, which is the spirit of murder on a continuum, if we don't learn this, then things that will happen in our lives, it will escalate and it will cause all kinds of trouble to us. And it will have the effect of basically putting us into prison. In other words, it's a form of bondage over our lives. It's a chain that will be affecting your whole life. So when Jesus is talking about this, he is not trying to like condemn you or put some kind of heavy burden on your heart. He's saying, look, I created your heart. I know what human beings are like. 
I know how what it is to be righteous and to be blessed, to have a blessed life. And I want you, I really want you to be there. So I'm going to take this really seriously with you, and I'm going to say, at the very seed level, you are going to work with me, and you're going to break this stuff off. You're going to deal with this stuff. Because if you don't, it's going to escalate, and you're going to be living in bondage. You're going to be held back from God. And we ask ourselves, what is the reason? Why don't I feel God's presence? Why don't I, why don't I feel alive? And deal with this, right? And, and, and you're like, well, what about what Jesus taught? about? So this is only the first one, right? There's like at least six different ones that Jesus t- touches on specifically in this, in this sermon. That are, that are chains to us, that are weeds in our heart, right? It's like, what about these things that Jesus taught? How are you doing with that? How are you doing with anger? How are you managing anger? Um, how are you uh, dealing with the little seeds that are gr- growing? Do you take that seriously? Do you, do you find healthy ways of working through it? Um, if you don't, then Jesus is saying, this is a bondage on you. You'll be, it'll be like being in prison, imprisoned. You won't have freedom in your life. So that's why this is one of the weeds that Jesus says we have to deal with this. Okay? Um, cool. In other words, I mean, so I was asking God about this, and I, I just have a short um, thing about it. I was just asking, Lord, you know, how, do you, uh, how do you feel like we're doing in our church? How are people doing? And this is what I felt like God was saying. Beware of my judgment. I am a consuming fire. I show no favoritism. Don't be deceived, living on the surface of things. My eyes and my gaze penetrate to the heart. And I look at what's inside, and all is laid bare before me. Um, I am love, and my heart is full of love for you. It's because of this that I won't let you rest while you remain in bondage. Okay, But I'm going to keep pressing on you because my requirement is that you be free. My demand, God's demand on us, is that we be free. It's his command that we be free, that we live in the freedom of the Lord. Um, And so he loves us so much that he's not going to leave us in prison. He's going to keep pressing on us until we work through it. This is what it's talking about. I tell you that you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. When will you get out of the prison that your anger has formed for you? When you pay every last penny, when you deal with all of the residue, the lingering anger issues that are there in your heart. That's when you'll get out. If you keep putting it off, keep putting, just, oh, okay, I know that I'm kind of angry, put it on the back burner, don't work through it with God, it doesn't go away. It, the debt remains, I mean, it's still there. It's simmering on the back burner and it's going to burst forth into experience, and it's going to be more complicated. It's going to be much harder to deal with if you keep letting it go, keep letting the root become more established. It's going to become much, much more difficult to deal with later on. And you'll still have to pay it back <laughs> later on, right? It doesn't go away, but it's going to be way harder to deal with it. So Jesus isn't talking like he wants to burden you. He's like, I want you to be free. I want to be sensitive to the things that hinder your walk with God. And I want you to be sensitive to the point where it's just starting. It's just at the level of a seed. And and you deal with it. You're that sensitive in your spirit that you see anger coming up in you. And it could be just as simple as saying, you said something angry to somebody or you had an angry thought. You pause. You say, Lord, you say what you just did. I I was just angry against my brother. I don't want to live that way. I repent. Of that, Lord, break that off me and let me keep going. And that might be enough to deal with it at that stage. That's really all you had to do. Just clear before God, take a stand against that anger that was growing in you. Say, no, I don't accept it. I don't walk in that. Lord, break it off me. I repent. And then press on into God. You know, it might be that simple at that stage to deal with it. But we should be the kind of people who who deal with it that way. And it's not, again, it's not God laying something on you to say, oh, I just want you to feel bad about yourself. I just want you to feel condemned because you got angry. Okay, we all get angry. It's rooted in us. But I want you to be the kind of people who, when that happens, you're sensitive to it. You know that, I mean, you might even say to yourself, well, the person that I was angry at 
they didn't even notice. So isn't that okay? Or they know they know that I'm just like that. I'm just the kind of person who gets angry and I express things in this way. And 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 that might be that might be the case that the person didn't actually get offended, they didn't get upset, but the Holy Spirit is not okay with it. And so we have to deal with it. We want to be sensitive to Him in that way, to the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, so it's freedom, it's freedom, and Jesus' heart and all these things. We have to see that that He's not. In, in giving us the law and saying like, oh, every letter of the law is going to remain and your righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees. But it's not, it's not burdensome. It's about love. It's about the Lord's love for you. And because of his love, he desires you to walk in freedom. Break off all the chains. Be living in freedom. And it's, okay, it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a long thing that we have to work through and deal with a lot of these issues. But the Lord is committed to helping us in walking in it. And he wants us to walk in these ways because then we can be blessed. We can live in this world not just under a spirit of darkness, but in the power and vibrant heart of God. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it, what I want to say today. But I do think it'll be good if we take some time now. Um, maybe we'll just play some, we'll just play a song. Uh, have some time to just ask the Holy Spirit how you're doing with this, okay? And, uh, yeah, and if the Holy Spirit highlights any person to you or any issue, you know, just commit to him. Say, Holy Spirit, I'll deal with it. And the starting of dealing with it isn't just right away go to the person and start blundering about something. Come to God, pray about it, you know, deal with it with God. And then if it needs a stage of going to that other person and dealing with it, especially if they're, if you've hurt them somehow by doing it, then go to that next stage. Go to that person, repent, apologize, right? And, and and apologize, right, in a in a real way. So <laughs> not in like a um there's lots of ways that people do apologies, right? They're like uh if I made you upset, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that how many people apologize like that? Have you ever apologized like that? If I made you sorry, if you're so emotionally weak that what I did in my innocence bothered you, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, you know, you had to deal with that because of your weakness. Right? That's not, that's not apologizing. That's not repenting, right? Go to them. Uh, I'm sorry that you did this and this and this to me. And man, that was really bad and really rough, and 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 it, and it made me mad. And I'm sorry. Okay, I mean, you might need to deal with that stuff in some way, and uh, so I'm not saying that's not legit, but that's not the apology part. The apology part is you say, "I was angry against you. I let it express in my words. That's wrong before God, and I repent of that. You know, and I and I repent. That means I'm turning away from that, and I'm committing myself to turn away and not live like that." Okay, are you guys happy? Yay! <laughs> you guys saying yay in your spirit? Freedom of the Lord. This is good. The Lord is good. He really loves you. And but real love, he doesn't he's not just going to let you stay in bondage. So, let's let him highlight anything to us and if he highlights something to you, you can pray about it. If you want to um if you feel like there's something on your heart and you want to um, pray with somebody else, even like today, um, you can do that. Make sure that you talk to somebody, okay? You can talk to me, other people who are uh, leadership, um, prayer team. Who Who's currently on the prayer team? Scott, um, Clara, okay, me. You can talk to Leonard, um, okay? So come and... Yeah, we could even have a time today, even like during lunch, if you want to talk to someone, have some prayer over any issue, we can do that. Um, but just right now, we're going to spend some time before God and uh, let, him, let him talk to us. Just talk to him.